Amén. Buenas tardes. Si alguien necesita interpretación esta noche, tenemos el programa también en español, gracias a nuestros, nuestras excelentes intérpretes. Entonces, por favor, si alguien necesita interpretación al español, acérquese a nuestros intérpretes en esta esquina y les ponemos equipo. Thank you to our interpreters. the same because the way we do music in the campaign is that we need all of you everyone in this room to lift up your voice right. and to sing with us because we need not only the folks here in this room to be filled we need all the folks out on those streets all across Wisconsin all across the Midwest all over the country to be filled with the spirit that we are bringing here tonight how do I how are you feeling about that yeah Reverend Liz just made a very good announcement that if you don't see yourself represented up behind me, we want to fill in and make sure we know we're building a fusion movement. That's right. So we would love to have a few more folks come up here and to make sure that you see yourself represented up on this stage. And so if you don't see someone that looks like you or resonates with you, we would love for you to come up and join us. And I got a beautiful collection of voices up on the stage already. Y'all know this song? I woke up this morning with my mind. That's it. Stay on freedom, on justice. All right, here we go. I woke up this morning with my mind. Here we go. You got me a key. There we go. I woke up this morning with my mind. Stay Thank you. 
nobody gonna turn us around. We ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. Ain't gonna let poverty turn us around. Ain't gonna let injustice turn us around. So, let's sing this song. I'm gonna let it shine. As poor people, we're told that we have no light inside of us and that there's nothing that we have. But we are leading this movement to end injustice. And so we're each gonna take one moment to think about the light that's in each of us and that's in our neighbors. And we're gonna let that little light shine.
right, we need some of that jump off choir to join us up here. So a couple more seats got to be filled. Yeah, please, join us. please join us, please join us. And welcome. Welcome to this mass meeting where we're readying ourselves for a mass poor people's and low wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington and to the polls on June 18th, 2022. Are you ready, Wisconsin? Are you ready, Wisconsin? Are you ready, Wisconsin? We want to welcome some of our Poor People's Campaign siblings from Illinois, from Iowa, from Indiana, from Minnesota, from Ohio, and from all across this great state and nation. My name is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. I am a daughter of Wisconsin, a proud Milwaukeean, and it's great to be in this state with you all today. Now, Wisconsin, I don't know if you know this, but before this pandemic, there were two million Wisconsinites who were poor or one health care crisis, one job loss, one small emergency away from economic ruin. That was 49% of our kids, 39% of women, 71% of black people, 62% of Latinx people, and 1.4 million poor white people. And that's right. It's just not right. And it does not have to be that way. So we're here building a movement, a moral movement from the ground up to right these wrongs and to confront systemic racism and poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of health care, militarism, and this false narrative. So we're having a, a mass meeting like those that have come before and the real people that we're here to listen to are folks that are impacted. But before we hear from them, we want to be welcomed to this beautiful house of worship. And so I want to introduce Reverend Mark Fowler, the lead pastor here at the First United Methodist Church. Thank him for welcoming us here and for why he and all of us are getting ready for June 18th. So Reverend Mark. I hope uh, we begin that all of you will join me in uh, welcoming uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris home and that you consider this your home for this evening. We're glad you're here. As you came in uh, tonight, you may have noticed that on the sign outside, uh, it says downtown for good. Like many churches, when downtowns went the way of many downtowns, churches decided to move out to what they considered more fertile fields. And God bless them, and we do, and I worship with them from time to time. But this church saw the need downtown in Madison as a symbol of many downtowns throughout Wisconsin uh, and throughout the country and throughout the world. That it was a downtown that was filled with people that were hidden in the shadows and not recognized by those up the hill, or enough of those up the hill that the numbers that Reverend Dr. Liz talked about continue sadly to increase. And so we want to welcome you to a house of worship that does not simply gather in this beautiful space, but gathers here to join with the spirits of many who have chosen this place to stage advocacy in the world. And so your song is added to their song, which has been a song that we have sung together over many, many, many decades, because we are filled with the hope 
that is preached by the Poor People's Campaign, recognizing that religious leaders have authenticity when they not only are with, but for the poor, the marginalized, and the most needy, and we stand with you. And the more that we stand together, the more that evenings like this are not only filled with determination that this must end and a better world must come, but in the meantime, in the meantime, did you see yourselves? What a reunion, what a reunion amongst friends that we have not met yet. And so we're glad that you chose this house to come, a house that is attempting to live into our creed that all means all. And we are grateful that you raise your voices here and in Washington, but that the poor people's movement and the movement for all marginalized people, all ignored people everywhere, is not just for Madison or your hometown or this state or this region or this nation, but it's a great place to start. But it is the promise that has been made in the great religions and even amongst those who have no religion but are people of goodwill that we will overcome and one day sit at the same table, not one at the head and one at the foot, but that we will all share the bounty together. Just one final word, uh, and I want to thank the Poor People's Campaign for choosing us. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank my good colleague, Rabbi Bonnie Margulies, who chose us. Would you stand, Bonnie? She too recognized we had good geography, and I'm grateful to you. So I want to pull our, our tri-chairs from Wisconsin up to help welcome us to, to this great state. The Poor People's Campaign is a national movement, but it's only national because we're nationalizing state-based movements. And those are led by those that are most impacted, moral leaders and activists and advocates from all across the state. So, so welcome um, uh, Sarah Weintraub, Brittany, and Reverend Ari. Thank you all so much for joining us here tonight. My name is Brittany Reamer. I'm from Wausau, Wisconsin. I'm Sarah Weintraub from Milwaukee. Reverend Ari Douglas from Janesville, Wisconsin. I'm finding it. Yep, yep, I got it right here. Thank you for your patience. Oh, cool. <laughs> Hi, so welcome everyone to the Into Madison, Wisconsin stop of our mobilization tour on the road to the Moral March on Washington, D.C. and to the polls and on June 18th to D.C. <laughs> Tonight we pick up the work of the poor, original Poor People's Campaign started back in 1968 by Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and many other leaders of the poor and dispossessed, including Father James Gropey. I think I said that right? Gropey, sorry. Uh, obviously, I'm not originally from Wisconsin. My apologies. Uh, right here in Wisconsin, like they did, uh, we are fighting the five interlocking injustices of systemic racism, ecological devastation, uh, syst uh, systemic poverty, uh, militarism and the corrupt moral narrative of religious nationalism as well as the lack of health care. Um, yeah. Thank you. So this evening 
We are going to hear from speakers from all across the state of Wisconsin, as well as Illinois and Iowa, about how they're impacted by these interlocking injustices and why they've joined this movement to end poverty in a country with 140 million, nearly half the entire nation, who are poor and low income, including, like Reverend Liz said, two million who are right here in Wisconsin. It's time that we make a real moral and political commitment to democracy, human rights, and values that this country has yet to live up to. And to do so, we must build a powerful movement. That's why we are here today, because we're mobilizing and organizing right here in Madison, in Wausau, in Milwaukee, in Beloit, in Green Bay, we're coming together and building a movement from the North Woods to the Fox Valley, from the Driftless region to our big cities, and we will keep building it tomorrow and the next day and every single day after. So, let's move forward together and not one step back to D.C. on June 18th and to the polls this spring and fall and beyond. That's right. Let's hear it for the leadership of the Poor People's Campaign here in Wisconsin. Let's hear it for everybody that is gathered here tonight. Let's hear it for the folks that are going to testify and come before us and talk about our stories and the solutions that we have at hand. Before we hear from folks that are most impacted here in Wisconsin and across other states, we're going to watch a video. We're going to ground ourselves in this, uh, this moral movement that we're building, the way that the rejected are going to lead this justice revival, and then immediately following this, build, the build, this video, the next two voices you'll hear are Mark Denning and uh, Audrey Taylor, uh, who are, are folks from here in Wisconsin who are going to speak um, to, to why we're doing this work and, and why we must keep on fighting towards June 18th and beyond. is right. Saving this democracy's possibility is non-negotiable. This is about right versus wrong. And the right time to do right is right now. 140 million people in this nation are poor or one emergency away from economic ruin. But it does not have to be this way. And you look at the diversity in this crowd. This is the America they are afraid of. In the 1960s, Democrats and Republicans stood up together for social justice. It was the right thing then, and it's the right thing now. We know that if Linda Baines Johnson was here, he would be saying, free to vote! Free to vote! The goal of the Poor People's Campaign was to help the poor confront the evils that create poverty. But my father used to tell me, don't piss down my back and tell me it's raining. The government should listen to our voices, no matter our race, citizenship, or how much money we have. We are not lazy. We are exhausted from the endless cycle of poverty. <laughs> We are demanding what is morally fair and just. You need to stop suppressing and regressing and start addressing and resurrecting. So stop messing with our right to vote. We need to make it easier to access the ballot. We need to make it easier to live with dignity and respect without struggling. We didn't take shortcuts when we marched, 
and we don't deserve to be shorted in this legislation. That's right. My body is tired, my voice is shaky, and my mind is determined. I have done nothing but fight. We know that for democracy to work for us, it has to work for all of us. It has to include all of us. So show, show me, me what, what democracy looks like. The persistence, the strength, and the courage of this movement is what it's about. For the sake of bringing change to all our communities. I want the people to win. <laughs> Take this opportunity in my hand. Change does not come from the top down. It comes from the bottom up. And we recognize as people of faith, this is the work of the church, but it is not only the work of the church. We got a word for the U.S. Senate. Come back to Jesus. When we show up and show out, we walk our talk. Together, we are strong. We can protect each other. Yeah. Insurrections never win. Yeah. Only resurrections win. Yeah. And history tells us what we have to do when states work to subvert democracy. We're not going to let them stop us from coming out. And this is our country, and I'm what an American looks like. <laughs> The biggest gun we got is called a ballot box. We must rise up as a more army. And creating an America where everyone counts. We must challenge every weak Democrat, every sorry Republican, every silent independent that you will not stand in the way of our right to vote. Ain't gonna let nobody turn you around. Okay. It's time for the rejected to lead a revival of justice. and Audrey Taylor. Uh, they're, they're the two folks that are going to start with our testifiers. We have a way of doing things in the Poor People's Campaign, which is that it's often our, our inclination to clap. But folks are telling stories that we don't applaud. So instead of clapping and, and cheering, we want to say, somebody's been hurting our people. And we won't be silent anymore. So after each speaker goes, we're going to say, somebody's been hurting our people, and we won't be silent anymore. All right, so Mark Denning. Oh, okay. Audrey. Good evening, everyone. My name is Audrey Taylor and I'm the leader in the fight for 15, and we are here to join the Poor People Campaign. I am a mother of two, a grandmother of two. I have worked for Wendy's off and on since 1995 until now. During that time, <clears throat> I have made only $8.25 per hour. That wage didn't support me and my babies. And now that I'm a grandma, it don't do nothing for us now. It's even harder to be exact. Gas prices have went up, food prices have went up, lights, water bill, but we don't have no kind of money for leisure. We can't go to the movie, we really can't go out and shop, buy an outfit, a pair of shoes, or whatever the case may be. But guess what is going up? our wages, trying to pay rent, keep the light on, pay our water bill, put food on the table, it's hard. And like I said, it leaves no room for leisure time. Being in the fight for 15 has brought me awareness about a lot of things that is, that's been going on. 
But in the fight for 15, it stands for something. People who are working, we are the ones who do the work and make the money. Not the people in, in <clears throat> excuse me, not the CEO. They sit back, they wait for us to bring the money in. We are the people who's in the forefront, the cashiers, the crew people, what they're doing. They sitting back with their legs crossed, hitting their bank account, checking their money. But we're not. We still trying to find a way to make more money. If it means going out trying to find a second job, <clears throat> maybe a third. Who knows? They don't care. We're not just here for the people who work for the fast food restaurant. We are here for people who work in the nursing home, security guards, anyone that's trying to be out there to make a paycheck. Things need to change. We come together in America to look for the most vulnerable in our community. Like we said in the campaign, when we lift from the bottom, everyone rise. I, I believe in the Poor People Campaign. It's important to me because it's a reality and I'm poor. I don't, I don't have thousands or millions in my bank account. I work hard every day to make ends meet. So I understand the Poor People Campaign and all about, and I will keep fighting with the Poor People Campaign until we all have what we want. Things I'm going to say today is about mental health, depression, and suicide. So anybody in here who's living in that place of risk, I'm going to ask you to leave because it's going to get very truthful and, and, and very, very real. And now's that chance. And uh, I'm going to ask you to come up here for a moment. And the person that brought me up, because when we ask indigenous people to speak, Sarah, we give them tobacco. It's a, a sacred plant. There's someone here who's keeping time, and I'm respectful of that time. I'm only going to go, and when that says stop, I'm going to stop right there. I'm not going to finish my thought, I'm not going to do any of that because these people deserve their respect. So if you could come up here for a second. And I wanted this to, to do this while people made their way out of here. Okay. I'll give that to you. And now I'll pass you your tobacco. No way to you and way I'm do not a way but nazi indigenous cause in me and no them. Anishinaabe, omen omen Lenape, Delaware, Mohicanoc, French, English, and Dao, Neopit, Indonjaba, the place I am from. I was asked here today by your ally in Milwaukee to give an indigenous perspective. And that perspective today is on mental health and suicide. I am the nephew of Badwebudan Benesi Aban. His name is, you know him as Eddie Benton Bene the Grand Chief of the Three Fires Society, and a founder, one of the founders of the American Indian Movement. He is the one that named me and asked me within our Grand Medicine Lodge of Medewan people. That means the way of the heart. We were at the center of every one of our villages and considered medicine people and speakers. So what I came here today to share with you is my short story. When I came here, it was very difficult. My daughter's last home, three and a half blocks from here. And that was the very first place I went. I cannot represent all indigenous people, 
what and who I represent as the Fires Day one is to lift and carry my responsibilities to speak for the dead and the unborn, the voiceless, one of our most sacred trusts. Our prophecies speak of a fork in the road now, the end of the seventh generation and the beginning of the eighth. The destroyer waits impatient at the end of one of those forks. And a true and just life waits on the other. This path, this spiritual place was as the world was intended. Our great creator intended and gave us all that we need here on earth. And it has been the men that have kept you, the impoverished, from having all that you deserve in life. It is not our great creator. It is not a scarcity in the world that is of pretend. It is of the world of men, the world of the eye. In that way of our great destroyer, who does his job and his mission, is the path of the loneliness of the spirit. Six years ago, our son Taylor, a law school graduate, completed his suicide in Milwaukee. He did everything. Second generation going to college, law school. He knew his culture, he knew his creation story. He had given his tobacco to be a part of our grand medicine society, the way of the heart. Where he lay, hearts were broken across our great Turtle Island. We mourned for four days and four nights. And on the fourth night, we danced and sang with him. And on the last day, we sang that morning. We danced with them saying, when we closed his casket, his brother stood up and said, there should have been crime scene tape around his body. There should have been crime scene tape around his body. His words were a stark reminder that this is the difference between the culture of the eye and the culture of the we. In the culture of the eye, self-harm, suicide, ideation, and completion falls squarely on the individual. 33 days later, 33 days later, our daughter, a junior at UW-Madison, took her own life just three and a half blocks from this church. A working poor student, a university student, refusing to talk about a brother's suicide, went for help and was turned away. You don't have the insurance. We can't take your visit. Your help is someplace else. 33 days later, the suicide rate for American Indian girl is 139% since 1999. The society of the eye trails of evidence are easily traced. Premeditation is tracked, can be tracked. Deliberate genocidal crimes are recorded against my people. Homicide liability, plain in the historical view from this society. Complicity of economy and healthcare systems leave the poor and fragile unprotected. Racism is a public health care issue. The point, suicide is detectable. A reasonable person can draw a line between the intention, complicity, and causation of suicide. Criminal acts, this is either involuntary manslaughter or murder. The culture of the eye, the society of the eye, the individualism asks, this was an act of an individual. We'll wash our hands of it and say, 
until we meet again. That can be said with a smile. Two years later, their surviving brother, fueled by friends unknowing and young, himself, UW Madison, went to three credits short of graduation. Opioids pushed by the pill pushers of our United States government. Drugs of any sort. When people took him to a party, they would see his chair against the wall like that, looking for images of his brother and sister. That was my family. That was our family. The path of individuals and for the poor is poor. Individualism leads to the loneliness of the spirit. All of our suicides through all of our community deserve crime scene tape around every body that falls. That is my plea. That is what I came to say. And our young person <laughs> With the sign, I'm sure I'm over time. I, I didn't see all the words stop. I appreciate your kindness. Ronnie. And there's more. I want to call up Reverend Greg Lewis, as well as Marianne Olson. And if we could stand together, because we stand together in this movement. from when you have a testimony like that you just say the benediction and go home don't like to be behind such a powerful message but listen we have other messages I want to tell you about a city called Milwaukee Wisconsin where I'm the executive director of Souls to the Poles, and I'm a pastor at St. Gabriel's Church of God in Christ. I uh, created an organization called Pastors United, and now I created another organization to add on to all of that called Power to the Poles. And we had a organization do a survey in my community, black community, and they asked 25,000 people if they knew that there was going to be a mayor election in the city on April 5th, and 92% of them didn't know there was going to be an election. I guess I can't get no amens on that one. But 92% were zombies. Listen, you know, we have to do this thing together because we got to support one another because just like my brother, we all hurting here. And now what's got to happen is you got to forget all that other stuff that happened before. We got to band together and be what we can be for one another. We cannot continue to look down on one another and expect somebody else to look up to you. We have to work together. We got to be side by side. We got to do this and we have to do this now. Listen, voter suppression is a huge problem right now. It affects all of us, but most of us don't know it. 
good food, shelter, clothing, housing, good jobs, crime, our next dollar. That's what is on the minds of most people. We're not thinking about the many ways that people are stopping us from putting other people in place who can help us. Strict voter ID laws, excessive voter purging, failure to accommodate voters with disabilities, barriers to families assisting voters who are homebound, failure to inform formerly incarcerated persons of their voting rights, partisan gerrymandering, exact match requirements for signature or other information, complicated absentee ballot requirements, Sunday voting, souls to the polls, early voting. We have to educate ourselves and help our communities understand that we are in trouble, and if we don't stand up and fight, we're done. Now I got a sign talking about stop. Listen, stop letting people do things to you. Start making things happen for you. We can do this if we fight together. And if you're anything like me, man, I'll be biting, scratching, crawling, pulling until I die, until things change. Thank you, everybody. Somebody serving our people, and we won't be silent anymore. Hi. I am Mary Ann Olson. I live in Oshkosh. I'm married. I have three daughters, three granddaughters who have a sparkle in my heart. And I've been home from prison since June 2017 after serving 67 months. Thank you. I'm an organizer with Expo, Ex-Incarcerated People Organizing. And I want to tell you about the first Expo event that I attended. At that event, I was the only woman who didn't end up homeless when she came out of prison. And there's only one reason. My husband stood by me. If he hadn't, it had been unanimous. We'd have all been homeless. There was no system in place to provide us even the basic human rights. Like, come on, who among us isn't more than our worst choice, right? Y'all need to know another way that I am dehumanized and so many of us are dehumanized in this state and across the country. Because after I served that five and a half years, I still have another 21 years on extended supervision. And I don't know about you, 21 years is not rehabilitation, it's a setup. So for the entire 21 years, I'm gonna work like a dog and I'm gonna pay taxes, but I'm not gonna be able to vote. Right? Aren't we Americans? Why did we become Americans? We became Americans because 300 years ago, somebody said, you know, this taxation without representation? Nope, not working for me. So am I a citizen or not? I don't feel like a citizen. We're moving backwards in this country. And we need to fix it. And Reverend Bishop, said we need to put the heart back in this country. So let's meet in D.C. on June 18. And let's fix this because we deserve more. Somebody hurting our people and we won't be silent anymore. Our next two testifiers are Jason Rivera and Joe Peary. Jason's from Wisconsin and Joe is from Oklahoma. Who 
Hello, everybody. My name is Jason. Um, I just want to talk to you about my college experience, essentially. I'm 21. I'm a junior in UW-Madison right now. So I remember the drive to Madison for my first year of college, and I was so excited, and I was nervous, and I was like, I just can't wait to, like, you know, be able to, like, live my own college experience, you know? Every small city we pass over here, you know, every, like, economy walk and all that, it was, it was great. I was like, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be a college student. I knew it'd be hard, but I also knew it'd be worth it one day. I'd have a degree, I'd have a livable wage, I'd have a family, whatever I can do with that. And today, I can say that no one could have prepared me for how difficult it would have been, or for how difficult it currently is still. No, not the classes or that long walk up Bascom Hill over there, but just trying to survive. I was lucky to have my tuition fully paid for here by a people program, which helps out students in like Milwaukee and all over Wisconsin. But even with that, I still faced food insecurity and housing insecurity, and even had to drop out of school for a semester because I couldn't make ends meet. The leading response to students like me is, go get a job. And, you know, I have two right now. I work 30 hours a week as a student full time, and I have three during breaks. It's not that I and other students don't want to work. It's that we just don't have 40 hours a day. We don't have 90 hours a week to just go ahead and just work the entire time. It's unfair and immoral to ask kids who just graduated high school to drop their education and work to survive. I wasn't even allowed to vote three years ago. It's, a, uh, it's immoral to ask us to sacrifice our youth to save up money to eat the next day. To those who criticize and say, I've done it and I'm alive, would you do it again? You wouldn't. My sophomore year, I lost my state benefits because of a seasonal job I had. And by this point, I was a full-time student still and working, again, 30 hours a week as I do. Losing my, benefit, losing my benefits made it difficult for me to get any food. It sounds terrible, but I was actually rationing out my meals. I was going to McDonald's, cutting up a chicken in like four pieces for four days with some rice. No one deserves that. What's even worse at the, is that there are other students out there that have it way worse than I do. You need a degree now to earn a livable wage, yet we make it nearly impossible for those who already have, to, uh, who don't have much to succeed. They want us to succeed, and they don't give us the resources to do that. I don't want to go over too over time here, but I just like to say I'm tired. We're all tired. <clears throat> What's it called? My parents are tired. <laughs> my siblings are tired. What's it called? As a child of an immigrant, trust me, my parents are so tired. We're so tired, and that's why I'm here organizing with everybody else here, and that's why I continue to fight, and that's why I've had to fight all my life. <clears throat> we deserve whatever whatever we you know whatever we're fighting for here we deserve to have livable wages we deserve to not be homeless we deserve to not have to think about what we're going to eat the next day so thank you that's my story somebody hurting our people and we, and we won't, won't be silent anymore yeah i'm joe peary from the national union of the homeless and the illinois union of the homeless i'm formerly homeless i now live in public housing in chicago's cabrini green Two blocks from me are 440 units of vacant housing. We were promised that people would move out temporarily, the apartments would be renovated, and then people would move back in. Promise broke. Those units have been empty for over 10 years while homeless people die on Chicago streets. Wayne Warren survived the battlefields of Vietnam. He was found frozen to death in one of Chicago's tent cities. This is how the poor are thanked for their service. That's blood on the hands of the Chicago Housing Authority. When we complained, HUD told us they're saving public housing by making it private. What's been the result of that? An explosion in homelessness everywhere. Our lease contains dozens of legalistic ways to deny us basic human rights and to evict us. One part states that we can be evicted for criminal activity without an arrest, without a conviction, or proof, making us guilty until proven innocent. A young man who lived in one of those 440 vacant units, who was 16 years old at the time, was arrested because he had a joint in his pocket. The case was thrown out of court, but that then stopped the Chicago Housing Authority from using that part of the lease to threaten his entire family with eviction if they did not remove him from the home. With nowhere to go, the boy became homeless and dropped out of school. 
Wouldn't you think that child endangerment laws would have been looked at here? This has nothing to do with crime and everything to do with profit, because no matter how low the slave wages were that they paid us as factory workers, our rent was only 30 percent of that, which guaranteed them millions. As soon as our cheap labor was no longer needed, the HUD budget was cut and mass evictions began. Realtors were given lucrative contracts to manage like putting the fox in charge of the hen house. If public housing is to become a basic human right, we must remove private realtors from public housing along with their Jim Crow lease and expand affordable housing to all of our homeless brothers and sisters and tell all of them our house. Third, reconstruction. Fight for it, because the life you save just might be your very own. Just to be very honest, I'm uh, very emotional being here with everyone, sharing their testimonies, very powerful testimonies. I appreciate you. Hola, hola. My name is Oscar Sanchez. I participated in a 30-day hunger strike with our coalition made up of community members in the Stop General Iron campaign. And if you aren't able to tell, I am here filled with love and joy being able to stand in solidarity in the same fight we're facing in Chicago. I'm from the southeast side of Chicago, a low-income black and brown community that has been for a long time a sacrifice zone for the city. The mentality we grew up was keep your head low and don't raise any attention. We see our environment and become accepting of it, become familiar with it. But somewhere, all of us come to realization that we are deserving of better. In order to achieve that, we must speak up. Because just because we are poor does not mean we should be treated poorly. We are deserving of a system that is not dependent on the suffering of others. We are deserving of a system that addresses our needs, a system that allows our children and our future to exist without a 30-year life gap expectancy. Because that's what we're facing in Chicago, comparing the north side to the south side. We constantly fight the sources of trauma in our community violence that we carry through our lives that shows the difference of the difference, sorry, and violence that shows the difference in our qualities of life. I was raised by an undocumented single mother, and now my mother would always say, no tenemos mucho, pero el mínimo tenemos uno el otro. We don't have much, but at least we have one another. These are the words she say to me every time she dropped me off at a classmate's house, family member's house, neighbor's house that she was working 40 plus hours a week. She say this every time she would grip my hand going through thrift shops and food pantries and heading to church. So for me, we had everything due to community. My mother and I were never alone. We are never alone. We owe it all to our community the people constantly fighting for the communities that we deserve. We are not alone in this struggle. We are not alone fighting. Community to me means having, having each other. So when a serial polluter in the city of Chicago created a backdoor deal to move their operations from the north side with a rich white community to the southeast side, a poor black and brown community, we fought. After months of protest, community teachings, we decided to go on a hunger strike. 
The same people who set up mutual aid systems were at the forefront of this fight. And we put our lives on the line to disrupt the system from doing what it does, disregard our lives. I'm here to say we won. So, I mean, you know the chance, say it with me. Because when the people fight, the people win. And we will continue to fight racism with solidarity. We will continue to fight poverty with solidarity. We will continue to fight. There is no justice without restoration. There is no justice without reparations. We demand justice against the violence that all of our communities face every day. We are fighting for the communities we deserve, and we are fighting for restorative justice. Marching to the heartbeats of those before us, we are the children of those who challenge the system that is not meant for us. My brothers and sisters, my siblings, I want you to remember this. The promised land is coming, and it will come from our bravery and anger rooted in love and rooted in community. So remember, we have each other. Thank you. Somebody is hurting our people, and we won't be silent anymore. We're going to have some faith leaders join us to share a litany. But isn't it powerful? Isn't it powerful when we hear the voices of those, the stories of those, the power of those? And aren't those the stories that we need to hear on center stage for the mass poor people and low wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington and to the polls? It sure is. It sure is. So I welcome Rabbi Bonnie, Reverend Carla, Mark Denning, Pastor Peter, and all of us that are gathered here to share in this litany. Throughout our sacred scripture and the world's religious traditions, there is a call to stop depriving the rights of the poor, a prohibition against profiting from pandemic and crisis. There are commandments to pay living wages promptly, to deliver equal protection under the law, to welcome the immigrant neighbor, to provide for the needs of the entire community as we care for the land, air, and water. The moral message of the world's religions is everybody in, nobody out. Everybody has a right to live. When we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. So as those representing the 140 million poor and low-income people in the nation, moral leaders who are pricking the consciousness of the nation, we cry out the words of the movement anthem Somebody's been hurting our people. It's gone on too long, and we won't be silent anymore. We declare it is time for a moral movement that can revive our democracy and fully address poverty and low wages from the bottom up. We commit to assembling and marching on June 18th at the Mass Poor People and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington and to the polls. Join us as we compel the nation to mourn, feel the pain and the power of our people and to see that the path of healing and justice is possible.
It's a lot. When 250,000 people die in the richest country in human history, and this was before the million who have died because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't be silent anymore. When nearly half of the country and more than half of our kids live in poverty, we can't be silent anymore. When there are 14 million families who can't afford water, when 55 million folks are going to lose their right to vote that voted in the 2020 election, when immigrant rights are under attack, Native and Indigenous people are under attack. Young people and trans people are under attack. We can't be silent anymore. And so we're gathered here this evening to call for a radical redistribution of political and economic power, to call for a revolution of moral values and to build the power to enact all our demands. We're here, we're called this evening to rise together for a mass poor people and low wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington and to the polls on June 18th. Because if there ever was a time to fight, it is now. Now is the time for poor people and all people to come forward with bold and visionary demands and to sing out and cry out and march on that there's something wrong in this nation. But those who have been rejected are indeed leading a revival. I know we're from different faith traditions in this congregation this evening and people that don't come from a particular faith tradition, but as a creature, Christian pe preacher, I want to share a favorite Bible verse of mine that comes from 1 Corinthians. I think it speaks to who has the power to build power and to enact change in our world, a power that we have for sure heard this evening in the testimonies that folks have shared, a power that we will hear from that stage on Pennsylvania Avenue on June 18th. The message translation of 1 Corinthians 1 reads, isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks, exploits, and abuses. Chose these nobodies to, to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. Now, this isn't the way that society is supposed to work. Politicians, business leaders, lawyers, they're the ones that are supposed to save our world. They're the ones that are supposed to come up with policies and plans that reduce inequality and make society work for everybody, especially the wealthy. It's not the poor, the dispossessed, the beaten, the low wage, the homeless. And people of faith, religious leaders, are supposed to preach the good news of wealth and prosperity to the rich and then preach to the poor, there'll be pie in the sky when you die. But that's a lot. After all, the message 
of the gospel. And the message of our movement is that it is possible, it is necessary to end systemic racism and poverty and the destruction of our environment and the militarization of our communities and that it is poor and low-income people who will show the way to that transformation, to that reconstruction. We learned this from a deep history in this country and in this state that has produced generations of abolitionists, women suffragists, union organizers, all forms of freedom fighters. And we know it to the very core of our soul. As Dr. King and others announced the Poor People's Campaign of 1968, a campaign that we still must finish, he said, the dispossessed of this nation live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize against the structures through which the society is refusing to take means which have been called for and which are at hand to lift the load of poverty. There are millions of poor people in this country who have very little, even nothing to lose if they can be helped to take action together. They will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. We live in a time of great suffering and loss. So much of what is going on just doesn't make sense. How is it that we throw away more food in this country alone, not just to feed everyone hungry here, but across the world. And yet half of our kids go to bed hungry in this rich nation. Here in Wisconsin, we've seen concerted attacks on voting rights, families struggling with the lack of health care and low wages. We've heard about rising homelessness the mistreatment of immigrants and indigenous people and tribes. In this region, there's the pollution of air and water and land. So we must commit to uniting the nobodies, building a moral fusion movement, organizing and uniting people across all the lines that divide us showing that another world is possible, that poverty and oppression are not inevitable, and that all people, all people, all people have dignity, yes. not that some life That's right. is more sacred than others. Right. So we must build power, and that's what we're doing the power to declare everybody in, nobody out. 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 We're going to watch a one last short video to see the power of people. Then the next voice you'll, you'll hear after that video is Reverend Dr. Alvin O'Neill Jackson, the executive director of the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington. From there, we'll call on all of us to get involved. Forward together.
happens while we're getting ready for the video, if uh, the organizers, the ushers would, if, if you don't have a pledge card if, as we're getting ready for the video, if you just raise your hand, slip your hand up, and we'll get you a pledge card. This is the part that everybody gets a chance to participate in. So if, if you don't have a pledge card, many of you got them as you were coming in. Uh, some didn't, so just raise your hand. And uh, down front here, uh, there are a couple of hands, some hands down. So, so the video is coming, and we're going to all have our pledge cards in hand soon. We're almost at the end of our program tonight. We must be honest about the foundations of the political and economic systems we call America. I love America because of her potential. But I know that America will never even get close to being a more perfect nation until we are honest about the politics of rejection. I want to tell you about some of the leaders who are building the Poor People's Campaign. Callie Greer from Selma, Alabama, who had to bury her daughter, Venus. Because she didn't have health care. I'm here today to share my daughter Venus's story. Venus discovered a small lump in her breast. She wasn't insured. Venus had to be approved for every prescription and every piece of medical equipment that she needed. I'm standing here today in solidarity with the Poor People's Campaign because no one should have to bury their child in America because they don't have health care insurance. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am a working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. I'm a second generation fast food worker and I've experienced the cycle of poverty firsthand. Growing up, I watched my mother endure long hours of backbreaking labor, doing everything she could to feed me and my sister. My employer barely pays me enough to pay rent and utilities, let alone the medical expenses with my mother. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lungs, and it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. I'm a Vietnam veteran. My only ch chance of going to college was joining the Army. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked. Now I'm also a Kansas farmer's wife. Kansas farmers are committing suicide at a far greater rate than the national average. Why? Because they're stressed out. They're stressed out. They're usually in debt up to their eyeballs because they can't pay for all the equipment that it takes to run a farm. And they're usually, they're in the most dangerous line of work there is, yet they, many can't afford to buy health insurance. We have no hospital. We are in a food desert. We have one grocery store for the whole county. Our neighbor, my husband's uncle, still drinks pond water self-treated with chlorine. He had to have a kidney removed at age 64. And the year before that, his wife died of some unknown cancer. Hi, my name is Pamela Roche. I'm from Hines County, Alabama. And I live in a mobile home with my two kids. And I got raw sewers. I don't have no, no money. I'm poor. And I have to travel back and forth to Birmingham to take my daughter with the CPAP machine. Don't have my car. I don't have no way to take her. This is the largest encampment in Aberdeen. There's about 1,000 people in a town of 16,000 who are homeless. In my community, we were all shut off for the day because none of us could afford our water bills. In the past, my family wasn't able to afford electricity in the winter. It was very hard on all of us. But the indigenous people in the surrounding communities are already affected. We talk about health care. 
We talk about worrying about the environment, but yet when they're allowing open pit mines and um, letting it leak into the land, into the water, the high rate of cancer and the high bills of health is going to continue to raise because of corporations and greeds and politicians that don't want to listen. There's a new chemical company that's producing another carcinogen in our community. It's amazing. The people who are just started dying of cancer. And when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, I was amazed at the black women that would ring our doorbell and walk in the door and pull a wig off to show my wife that I have it too. This wall, this is sin of the highest form. I put my life on the line at 17 years old to uh, defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And right now what we have, we have domestic enemies right here. When there are 38 million poor children, when 60% of African Americans are poor, when 65% of Latinx are poor, when 40% of Asians are poor, when there are 67 million poor white people, we must say, this is not right. Somebody's hurting our people, and it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. Our brothers and sisters are sleeping on the street. For a country this rich to have so many people poor, it's immoral and it's wrong. Our backs are against the wall, and we got no choice but to push. <laughs> We lift our voices for justice, we put our bodies on the line for mercy, and together we will proclaim liberty throughout the land for the enslaved, for the poor, and for us all. Yeah. All of that breaking news in Albany where a large group of protesters have moved into the street. Washington Avenue between City Hall and Lark Street closed down. Protesters with the Poor People's Campaign of Indiana. Two o'clock on the East Coast. Two o'clock in the middle, two o'clock on the west coast. A wave, and the historians tell us this never happened before. Our communities, Muslim communities, who have joined the Poor People's Campaign, you can count on us. Our democracy is in trouble. Our democracy is in trouble. And we come to demand. And we come to demand. I cannot stand here and claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and be silent about the moral outrage that is going on in our country. Because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard. No one is listening. We write letters, we make calls, no one is listening. So we gotta make our, find a way to make ourselves heard. Six of the Kentucky State Constitution okay. that says we have a right to free assembly. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor.
Uh, you know, if I was in another setting, I would say, let the church say amen. But I, and I think you can do that even here, can't you? Well, this has been a good day. This has been a good day in Wisconsin. This has been a good day in Madison. And uh, so sisters and brothers, family, friends, all, we say thank you to our co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II in North Carolina tonight, our tri-chairs, uh, Wisconsin and the other states that have come and joined us. We say thank you to our host pastor, Reverend Fowler, who has opened the doors of this beautiful place. All of you tonight and all of you gathered online all across the country, I am Alvin O'Neill Jackson, native of the Mississippi Delta. Is my friend Jane still here? Jane must have left. I, I found a wonderful friend uh, from, uh, who knows all about Indianola and Sunflower County, Mississippi. But I'm a retired pastor in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Well, I was retired, but I've been rehired. <laughs> and I'm fired up and I'm ready to go. I'm uh, old and sometimes slow. I've Lost all of my hair, you could call me G.I. Joe too, but don't slap me, somebody will get that. I have suited up, I have suited up, rolled up my sleeves, retired, rehired, and fired up, and ready to go. And I've come tonight to ask you a question. As we end our evening tonight, I have a question. Are you ready for the meeting? Yeah. Are you ready for the meeting? Yeah. We are getting ready for a meeting. We've got to have a meeting. We need a meeting. And so are you ready for the meeting? Yeah. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is calling the nation together for a meeting. Where? Washington, D.C. When? When? The Mass Poor People's Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington and to the polls June 18. We are coming, but not just for the day, but we are coming June 18th to make a declaration of an ongoing committed moral movement that dares to change the political narrative, build power, and fully address poverty and low wealth from the bottom up. That's what we are doing. And so you go to www.poorpeoplescampaign.org. Everything is there. You can sign up even tonight. Fill a bus. Uh, uh, buses already, routes have already been set from Madison and Milwaukee and all places in between. Uh, you can pre-set a trip that's already been set up. Uh, and uh, just get on a bus and enjoy the ride. People are coming by bus, by train, by plane by car, some are even walking, believe it or not, uh, from the, from the, from mid-Atlantic area, are walking to, to Washington, D.C. All roads lead to Washington. So there are pledge cards. You have a pledge card in hand. I hope you will take a moment, if you've not already, fill it out, complete it, say that you're coming to Washington, D.C. on June 18th, and then I trust that not only will you sign up and make a commitment to come, but that you will make a commitment to bring somebody else, to encourage somebody else to come. Reverend Liz talked to us today about uh, the woman from the, uh, the march in 1963 who organized some, some 40,000 people. One person organized some 40,000 people for the march on Washington in 1963. You know, and uh, that, that was before email and, you know, all of this stuff we got. So we ought to be able to order, a, you know, a few folks, uh, you know, maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20. We, 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 we can do a few folks, can't we? So you sign up and then organize a few folks to come and join us as well. Some of us are even in position maybe to give a little money are to make it possible for others to come. We want everybody who wants to be in Washington, D.C. on June the 18th to be able to be there. And so there will be an opportunity tonight as you put your pledge card in, I'm going to ask us to get ready. Maybe our tri-chairs, uh, tri-chairs, would you come if you are available 
and maybe take these, uh, these offering trays here and uh, just kind of be ready with them in a few moments, Reverend Ari. That's great. And I'm going to ask you in just a few moments, I'm going to say another word or two, and then in just a few moments, I'm going to ask us all to just kind of, uh, and then the choir's going to come in a moment, and we're going to sing, and we're going to come and place our uh, pledge cards in the offering trays, and uh, we're going to maybe just kind of surround the sanctuary here, and we're going to sing a little bit, and we're just going to kind of go out on that. But as we, as we close tonight, I want to remind you why we're coming to a meeting in Washington, D.C. We're coming because there were 140 million poor and low wealth people before the pandemic, and things have only gotten worse since the pandemic. We're coming uh, because 57 years after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, voting rights are under attack in nearly every state. We're coming because the climate crisis is devastating our communities uh, and our planet while fossil fuel companies are getting tax breaks and poor people are getting sicker every day. We're coming because there's nothing just about a nation that has spent $21 trillion on war, policing, and prisons over the past 20 years, and none of it has made us safer. Uh, even as the guns and missiles fire in the Ukraine and Europe, none of us are any safer. We are coming for a meeting because our politics are trapped by the lies of scarcity. Scarcity is a lie. There is abundance. The only scarcity there is is the moral will to do what's right. We are coming because we know what it has always taken to bring the nation to higher ground. People coming together. And so we are coming together by the thousands. By the tens of thousands, we will gather in Washington, D.C. when? Just to make sure you're listening, we're coming June 18, demanding that everybody has a right to living wages and health care and decent housing and voting rights and clean air and clean water and quality education and peace. We're coming and we're going to keep on coming until justice rolls down like waters. We're coming and we will keep on coming until what is moral and what is right and what is good and what is fair and what is decent and what is compassionate and what is right and what is righteous includes everybody and falls like an ever flowing stream. We're coming and we're going to keep on coming until the nation does right by everybody. We're coming. When are we coming? Come on, choir, sing. We got some pledge cards. We got some pledge cards. And I'm coming. I'm coming. Fill out your card. I'm coming. And I'm going to bring somebody, if you got an offering, even tonight, to place in the tray. Just come stand down front, uh, try chairs and let everybody come front. And then just make your way back around the sides. And we're going to just surround the sanctuary tonight. And we're going to. We're going to sing with the choir as they lead us and break every chain, break every chain. We're not going to stop until we break every chain that binds us, that binds this nation from doing right by everybody. Break every chain. Everybody, everybody in, nobody out. Everybody in, nobody out. Come on, choir, you sing. 